There's no nice way of bringing forth this message. And if I yell, I'm not yelling at you. What do you get when you have a few Jesuit priests, a Presbyterian minister, a deacon, a librarian, a young girl, and a lawyer, and you put it all together and you shake it up. What do you come out with? You come out with something called the rapture theory. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. So let me tell you the story. I completely flipped the sermon around today from what it was yesterday. But let's look at somebody. A little quote here from a nice guy that we all know of. His name's called Adolf Hitler. If you tell a big enough lie and you tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. You see, when it comes to the things of darkness, if we don't dominate as Christians, as believers in God, if we don't dominate the powers of God and the, or the powers of darkness, they will dominate us. And this is what has happened with lies and abominations that have been spread about what the Word of God says. <clears throat> to make theories, people have to take the Scripture not literally, but they've got to take it allegorically, meaning that they've got to, it's, it's some type of a, a poem or some type of a story, and it really doesn't mean anything. And a lot of people think that's what Revelation was, and that's what everything that happened in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they, they, they get out there and they say, oh, those are just allegories. They're just stories, the good stories of old. And that's why Christianity may go down as one of the biggest lies because we got away from the things of God, and people made up their own ways, they made up their own religions, they made up their own doctrines, and we said all along, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is what's happening now, and yes, he is, but it doesn't mean you throw everything else out, but because of that, it is absolutely time to pay the piper, and judgment is coming to the face of the earth. We get a few other theories that kind of coincide with some of this stuff. Theories such as Israel returning home is just going to be a, a spiritual Israel, and yet Scripture is very definitive that we are going back to the land given to our, by our forefathers. In Jeremiah 33, verse 7, we're laying up some groundwork here. I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return, and I will build them up as I did at first. And when it talks about there, as I did at first, that will be an absolute glorious time because it's about keeping his holy covenant is what that's referring to there. Zechariah 12, verse 7, another supporting scripture. The Lord also gave the tents, will also, the Lord shall save the tents of Judah first, which has happened, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. And this is all about tearing down religious theories, allegories. Another theory. Oh, the church is Israel. Israel is Israel. Israel is the ten lost tribes and Judah and Benjamin combined. Ephraim being what? The ten lost tribes of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom consisting of Judah and Benjamin, Benjamin kind of melded in there as a small one, small tribe. But those two sayings right there, those two sayings right there have allegory thought. And they have to have hidden and special knowledge added to it. Doesn't scripture talk about don't add to, don't take away? That's special knowledge, though. Here we're talking about Gnosticism. We're talking about heresies. And those philosophies like that, Gnosticism, heresies, have bled right in to the teaching of the rapture. Let me say something blatantly clear. There's not going to be any pre-trib rapture. There's not going to be any mid-trib rapture. And there is not going to be any post-tribulation rapture. Blatantly clear. There's going to be a type of escape at the very end, but I'm not even going to use the word rapture for it because rapture, the word itself, comes from mysticism and the occult and what they used to do with levitating. And here we have it predominantly, we have sermons that 
promote this lie, promote this occult-ish word of levitating. None of these things, pre-trib, post, none of it can be substantiated in Scripture. Why do you think there are so many arguments about we're going to have a pre-trib rapture? Oh, it's going to be a mid-trib. It's going to be a post-trib. It's because it's not in the Word of God. People have made it up, and that's where we're going to get into the people who made it up and how it got bought by the people of God and spread around as gospel. You see, they look at that stuff and they believe that, but they won't even believe what's written in the book. To have a pre-tribulation or a post or a mid or whatever rapture you want to talk about, it requires additional insight from unsightful people according to God's ways of bringing things to mankind. But the church has a real serious problem now, don't they? A real serious problem because of the revelation knowledge that's coming forward with it, found within the scriptures and being brought to light. There's not two sets of rules, one for us and one for the Jews, one for Christians. There's one people, one set of rules, and God's not going to rapture one and leave the other one. He does not play favorites. He's not a respecter of person. He talked about how he was going to deal with Judah. He talked about the fact that, hey, Ephraim, we're a cake half baked, half turned. We got to flip it over. We're talking about what? Keeping the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. We were so fixated on keeping the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is great as what? Christians. That we forgot at, for a point in time all the things that were commanded for us to do that are found in the book of the law. At the same time, the Jews are fixated on the book of the law. And just like we mix, miss that, they're missing this. But God says he's going to do what? Reveal himself and show everybody. But there's a serious problem that the church is going to have to face. Now let's look back at this pre, mid, post. And let's lay some groundwork on how God does things. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But among the people, there are also false prophets, just as there will be false teachers among you. Under false pretenses, they will introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, and thus on themselves, swift destruction. What is this that we were talking about? This is the wrong way. Destructive heresies. What are destructive heresies? Deviations. What's a heresy? What's a heresy? It's an option. By properly, it's a choice. It's a sect. And this is going on today where people have been given a choice to believe these theories or believe the word of God and the depth of the word of God. The truth of the word of God, or some kind of wind of doctrine that's out there. And preaching the rapture is a destructive heresy. You have sex that will preach, oh, you don't need the Holy Ghost, you don't need to keep the law. All types of destructive heresies contrary to the word of God. In order to believe the rapture, let alone the fact that they only use two to three scriptures, you have to eliminate, you may as well get out your eraser, and you have to erase over 100, 200 scriptures in order for it to fit. Abomination, it's an abomination against the word of God. Now, what's God's way of bringing things forward? Amos 3, verse 7. We all know this one very well, I'm sure. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servant, the prophets. You see, God says how he's going to bring things forward, how he's going to bring revelation knowledge forward. And the way that the rapture theory was brought forward was when brought up, brought to mankind, is contrary to what God says and how God does things. Then that should be the first red flag that anybody should run across is the procedure proper. And we know it's not proper. But how many in the church and how many that believe this have actually studied it out to this point in time? 
or they just believe what the pastor has told them. No profit involved in the whole thing. Absolutely zero. And if it doesn't follow God's set way, why in the hell are people believing it? Makes no sense. But it's a fact that no Christian churches, no congregation, no fellowship that ever existed prior to 1830 ever proclaimed any type of rapture, any type of doctrine. 1830, that's not that old. My grandfather was born in 1902. It's only 72 years before that. What, my great-grandfather? We're only talking a couple gener generations. But no sect of Christianity, nothing would, that was, was being proclaimed about a rapture and some type of doctrine like this. And they all lean toward the fact of Thessalonians as the big raptors chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4. Those were accepted as resurrection verses. Now, those resurrection verses, it all got twisted up and it got tore apart, lied about, misinterpreted. And then it ended up getting put into the, the Schofield Bible. And we're talking about that. They were the first to carry the footnotes about the rapture. And where do those footnotes come from? From Darby. We're going to talk about him too. See, but we're going to investigate this thing. We're going to get to the root of it and show you how Satan absolutely brought forth that lie for people to believe and the reason why he brought it forth. The pastoral office couldn't teach you this stuff. And they have no right to try and bring anything forward of their myths. Again, it's not the way that God has ever done anything. And again, it's not the way that God does anything. And it's sure as heck isn't the way that God says that he's going to and does everything and always has done things consistently. And also be careful with internet information. Because I can go out there and I can find every sermon out there that will contradict scripture. I can find sermons that will promote the rapture. I can find sermons that will promote not keeping the law. I can find sermons that promote occultism. Again, no pre, no, no mid, and no post-trib rapture because scripture has absolutely got to be fulfilled. You see, there will be, again, there will be a type of rapture that would take place at the very, very, very end. But at that point in time, nobody's going to care about it. It's going to be so minuscule. When God says, okay, let's close the book. Let's, everybody, we're going. At that point in time, nobody's going to care. You're like, okay, finally, let's get, we've gone through this. But to tear this stuff out of your mindset, not so much yours. People are going to have to give in. They're going to have to give up. They're going to have to walk away from doctrines and lies. They're going to have to walk away from the fact that they think that they're Moses or they're Elijah, and they never will be. Because what they've got to do out here in the mainstream church, MSC, we have mainstream media that's coming out, and all the lies that they're talking. And we've also got the mainstream church and all the lies that they're talking. They're going to have to step aside of all this spiritual crap, their visions, their dreams. God told me this. God told me that. You know what that's all about? That is pride and that is sin. You see, people get indoctrinated. They get indoctrinated by everything and anyone who comes along with something that will tickle the, tickle the ears. Everything except a major prophet or the absolute truth and the depth of the word of God itself. When you have a theory that's built off two or three scriptures, and then they sit there and they stick with it, and they argue and argue and argue about it to promote it, why? I'll tell you why. Because long ago, they wanted to fill the church pews. They wanted to fill the pews. And they needed something that would tickle the people's ears even further. Ephesians 14 or 4 verse 14, we all know this one, that we should no longer be children 
tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men. And we're going to get into the men that did the trickery and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. It's not consistent. It's not scriptural with what the book says will happen. And it has to come through and be brought forward by tried and tested prophets of God, or it cannot be believed. But the great deception from darkness, most thinking they will be raptured away and some will end up taking the mark of the beast, thinking that they shouldn't be here because they're expected to be gone at that point in time. And that is the great deceit and one of the main reasons why darkness brought it forward for a people because he's hungry for blood and he's hungry for the blood of, of the Christians. He's hungry for the blood of the Christ keepers. Again, one God, one law, one set of rules, one set of commandments, and one people. Let me ask this question. Are Jews going to be left behind without having the opportunity to make some type of a decision or a choice? God's chosen people? It's not going to happen. There are 12 tribes and the Levites. He speaks in Scripture how he's going to handle each of them and bring them back together. We'll get into those verses as well. But again, you have to get out your eraser, and you have to eliminate those Scriptures. That's the more scary part than misinterpreting the Scriptures to bring forth the theory is to eliminate Scriptures to support your theory. It's an abomination. So the story. Let's talk about the story. And let's get into the depth of it. Now, you have heard me come up here many times and talk about, yeah, a little girl had a dream, and she passed it off to her pastor, and he got it. We're going to talk about all these people, but that's the summary of it. I'm going to get into some depth and where it actually started and the depth of it. We're going to go back to Pope Leo the tenth. We're going back a long way here. We're going back to the 1500s. He, had, he took three Jesuit priests, authorized them, commissioned them, to interpret Daniel's 70 weeks of prophecy. And the whole reason that he did that was to take the heat off the, pa of the papacy because they were talking about reforming the entire thing. And he wanted a distraction from that. So he set these three guys aside and said, okay, you go study this out and bring it back to me. It was Francisco Ribera was one of them. You see, Ribera's problem is that he came up with a, apolytic commentary talking about Babylon and the Antichrist, which we now today call futurist or rapture doctrine. So you can write that name, Francisco Ribera. But the problem was that his commentary, his futuristic interpretation, it rocked the Protestant church it also rocked the Catholic Church. And the Pope took what he had written and he had it buried. And it sat there for a long time. So a couple hundred years later, we introduced the next guy, a librarian. So we just got through the Jesuit priest. I asked you at the beginning. I'll ask you at the, at the end too. 200 years later, we have a librarian by the name of S.R. Maitland. He was appointed to be the keeper of the manuscripts in the Lambeth Place in London. So as he's maintaining this and going about his daily duties, he comes across this teaching from Ribeiro's Futurist Raptoristic, and he had it republished. And this is, goes back, this is in 1826. He also did a follow-up publishing in 1829 and another one in 1830. So now let's introduce the next character into this, John Nelson Darby. He was a leader in the Plymouth Brethren Church, an ordained deacon in the Church of England, and he became a follower of this S.R. Maitland and his prophetic endeavor to bring things forward. You see, Darby's influence in the seminaries of Europe combined with seven tours of the United States, 
changed the whole perspective and the whole view of ministers, and that trickled down into the affected churches of today. So this Darby teaching of Ribera was embraced radically by Cyrus Ingersoll Schofield, a lawyer. And Schofield adopted Darby's school of prophetic thought into the Schofield Reference Bible in 1909, which was heralded as the Book of Books. Where else do we hear the Book of Books? Yeah. His name's Aleister Crowley. Oh, we'll get to that one yet, too. Another contributor to the rapturous chaos, their so-called prophetic timeline from nonprofits, was from Emmanuel Lacunza. This back, dates back to 1731, and he did a little bit of a, a writing as well. Wrote a thing on the coming of Messiah, and the glory and majesty. And within that, he published it under a fictitious rabbi author named Juan Josephat Benzera. But then we introduced the next character, Reverend Edward Irving. And he contended that this was the work of a converted Jew and proved that even Jewish scholars embraced a pre-tribulation rapture line of thought. Remember, this thing was published by a fictitious rabbi. This guy grabs this fictitious rabbi and says, here, the Jews even believe it. Back to John Darby. John Darby, an ordained deacon, like we said, was acquainted with this Edward Irving, and they visited Margaret MacDonald. Let's introduce the next character into this, a young girl who had a vision. So now we get her little vision, combined with the knowledge that was gained from S.R. Maitland teachings and the new push from the Irving MacDonald teachings, and all of this got shooken up and all mixed together, and it wasn't long until they started persuading others to start following along, which gave birth to the Urbanites. The problem with this Margaret MacDonald was that she had a little bit of an issue. Oh no, that's not just a little bit of an issue. She had a big issue because she was absolutely opened up to the occult. You see, many people don't know this about this Miss Margaret MacDonald who had this vision. She was often seen levitating. Levitating. Again, back to the mystics of what rapture truly meant at that point in time and what it was all about and the word coming from what, the 13, 14, 1500s? You see, medieval, medieval mystics described their own levitation and her levitation of a few inches or a few feet above the ground. This is what she was doing and this is what they did in the occult practice when they used the word rapture. And her and her friend used to do this for fun. 15 years old. You think that God's going to be using a 15-year-old girl? Violate his word to bring forth some type of rapture theory? She is not a tried and tested prophet of nothing. At 15, you're not even tried and tested. So we get this Ribera. We get the Lacunza teachings. And we find this meeting point with John Nelson, uh, Nelson Derby. And this is the birth of all the lies. This is the birth that still affects and has trickled in to a doctrine and are prominently dominant in Christian churches worldwide today. Another person to bring in, and we already mentioned his name once, is Schofield. Schofield, the lawyer, was a student of Darby, a successful American lawyer. And Schofield 
published and he widely distributed Bible reference notes from in 1909. And from these beginnings, the errors have come widely accepted as gospel. Now let's look at another character. I'm going to talk a little bit about this guy because he's always intrigued me. Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley. I think we know I'll get into a little bit of him in a, here in a second. Alistair Crowley attended Darby's church. He was a young boy. His parents were devout Christians. And he attended Darby's church. And here's a bit of detail taken from a pro Crowley website. I'm going to read it word verbatim here. When other children attended the Presbyterian church to listen and fantasize about angels with halos or Moses parting the Red Sea or destroying the armies of Egypt, Crowley sat there transfixed listening to Darby tell the faithful attendees the rewards of heaven and the magical rapture of the evil and terrible day when those that did not put their trust in Jesus were left behind and this left behind to suffer in the hands of the Antichrist and the beast, beheading or torture their only way to salvation. You see, as a boy, Crowley was given a constant dose of the message that millions and millions of evangel evangelical Christians today believe and listen to about things that are going to happen in the future. See, during Crowley's time, when he was a young boy, the rapture was not a widespread theory. Those end time scenarios came afterwards. We just went through those days. But Crowley being brought up as a young, devout Christian, a member of the Plymouth Brethren sect, and he turned. He turned. He turned so greatly and got into so much mysticism that he earned himself the title of the great beast, 666. Emulating the beast in Revelation. All because of what? Mysticism that was preached? We're talking about men who walked around with books of mysticism. Not just the Bible. They walked around with books of mysticism. They walked around with occult books. And these are the men that brought forth the rapture theory. And out of all of this, what came forward from Crowley? And what did he boast about? Bringing forth the old aeon and the old order. The old order. It's not old. And it's not new now. Now it's the new aeon and the new order or the new world order. And the new world order is not new. It's very old setting it back as it once was back in the occult days. You see, Aleister Crowley, he eventually kept going with this and going with this, and he expanded, he modified something called the Gnostic Catholic Mass. And in this Gnostic Catholic Mass were all kinds of sex mysteries, which are embedded in the rites of witchcraft, Satanism, certain Gnostic sects, secret orders, such as the dragon order. But the idea of sex magic begins with the simple concept. The union between man and woman through spiritual practice, mimicking intercourse, with divine beings. Are you listening to me? Does this sound familiar? The new world order is a very old type of order. So to summarize all of what we just said, thanks to John Nelson Darby, we not only inherited some kind of crazy, wonky, unreliable, non-scriptural end-time theology, that oftentimes now we see it spawns all kinds of people out here setting dates, setting predictions of which 
fail. Those who claim to know the identity of the Antichrist or how some future events bring us closer to the return of Christ when we're not supposed to know when he's going to be sent back because scripture says that. But thanks to the twisted things that Darby brought forward, he also birthed one of the wickedest men that ever walked the face of the earth in modern time, Aleister Crowley. And how many other people like him? Not only him, but how many other people like him? How many people have been spawned into wickedness because of lies, deceit, mysticism? And now we've got an entirely an entire subculture of Christianity believing away from what the scripture says is going to happen. And they peddled that as the gospel of God. Lies. How many people have been turned away from the actual message of Christ himself? Let's look at Matthew 24, 37. Sex mysteries. Embedded in the rites of witchcraft. Jesus speaking here. But as in the days of Noah, what do you think he's referring to? So that also the coming of man be. For as the days that were before the flood, they, the wicked, that's who it's referring to here, the wicked, were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they, they, capital T-H-E-Y, they, the wicked, knew not until the flood came and took them, who's them? The wicked, all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Come on. We're starting to throw some bullets here at this rapture theory through Scripture. They and them that's referred to here, to here in Matthew 24 are clearly the wicked. Who are the wicked? Un godly believers keep going then shall two be in the field the one shall be taken what are we talking about the one shall be taken people have twisted this backwards and think that they are going to be taken it's talking about they the wicked here will be taken that's the way that god has always done it through scripture and it takes some type of twisting Two shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken away and the other left. The wicked shall be taken away. That's the way that God has always done things. That's the way it was done back in the days of the flood. He saved the righteous. He saved the righteous. Two men shall be in the field. The wicked one shall be taken. The wicked one shall be destroyed. And the other left. Luke 17, 37. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered. You see, he's answering their question of what happens to the ones that are taken. Jesus Christ is answering the apostles' question, the disciples' question. What happens to the taken ones? Where there is a dead body, the vultures will gather. But how can you take that when it's clearly in Scripture? And they use that for the, we're flying away, sweet Jesus. 2 Peter 2, verse 5. Peter speaking. God saved. What do you mean God saved? He kept safe. Noah. He kept Noah safe. He's telling, God kept Noah safe, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Who are the ungodly again? The wicked. Matthew 13, 24, verse, uh, 24 to 30. We get the parables here of the wheat and the tares. First the tares. Then Jesus continues on with that. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. Luke 17, 29, and 30. 
Jesus speaking here again. And Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The wicked are destroyed once again. Matthew 13, 47 through 50, Jesus speaking again. Oh, are we just going to throw him out the window? You're going to throw this out the window, church. You haven't got anything left. You've ab abandoned the commandments of God, and now you're abandoning, abandoning the testimony and what Yeshua is saying? Matthew 13, 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered there every, of every kind. When it was full, they drew it to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into the vessel. But threw the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and severe, sever the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. Once again, the good remain and the bad are thrown away. The wicked are taken and destroyed from among the just who remain on the face of the earth. We're going to walk through this. We're going to go through it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. Got Paul speaking here for all you Paul lovers, and I do like Paul, but I don't like the way that he's been misrepresented. For they, who is they again? The wicked shall say peace and safety, and sudden destruction shall come upon them, and they shall not escape. Another one, Matthew 24, 21, and 22. Mark 13, 19, and verse 20. Jesus speaking again. For in those days shall be affliction, as it was not from the beginning of the creation of God created until this time, neither shall be, and except that the Lord has shortened no day, those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he has shortened the days. How can he do that for the elect during this time if the elect went in the, in the rapture? Like, let's put some common sense. Again, another verse, 2 Peter 2, verse 5, Peter saying, Peter speaking here, God saved, kept safe, Noah, kept safe Noah, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. I think I have some editing errors here. In Luke 17, 29, 30, talks about the elect, the elect, the elect, elect is also mentioned again in Luke 18, verse 7, Romans 8, verse 33, Colossians 3, verse 12, Titus 1, 1. Back to Proverbs 2, 21 and 22, for the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect remain in it, but the wicked shall be cut off, destroyed from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. How much do you want me to throw at you? And this is just one aspect to tear down this whole thing with the rapture. The Bible is absolutely full of truth. Psalm 145, 20. The Lord preserve all that love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Proverbs 10, 30. The righteous shall never be, shall never be removed. Should we keep going? Yeah, you know why? Because if they're going to preach their bullshit, I'm going to throw it right back with Scripture right in their face. Proverbs 11.31, the righteous shall be recompensed in the world. Psalm 101, verse 8. I, God, will first destroy the wicked of the land. Psalm one night. Uh, 119, verse 119, talks about the wicked again. Isaiah 13, verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord come, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, uh, anger, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. What are you talking about? The earth. Let me ask you some common sense questions. Was Job raptured out of, of his little tribulation and his time that he had to go, his testing period? No. 
What about Joseph when he was in the pit? Was he raptured out of that? No. What about Daniel in the lion's den? Was he raptured out of that? No. He had to go through his own type of tribulation. Was King David raptured out of all, his, all the things that he had to go through? No. And you look even in Exodus. Were we raptured out when the ten plagues? Our forefathers, when the plagues of Egypt were going on, where were they? They were right there in the middle of it all. And it talks about the plagues, all these plagues coming back once again in Revelation, all referencing back to that. Where are we going to be? We're going to be there, and we're going to go through it with the protection of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo, were they, you know, the fiery furnace? Were they raptured out of that? No. What about Jesus Christ? No. What about Paul when he was in prison and had to go through all these things and had to go through the tough times? Was he wrapped? No. He went through it all. You know what it is? There's no rapture. There's much tribulation. Scripture has tribulation all the way through it. For our enemies. The enemies of God. And that's where we can go hand in hand with him. Hand in hand with him and follow him and his ways. Through the testimony of Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. While we're on the face of this earth, we have his set of rules called the law. And if you're on the face of this earth and you want the protection while you're on the face of this earth, it's tied to the realm in which it operates and that is the commandments of God on the face of this earth. Accepting Yeshua is absolutely everything, but that's for your eternity. That's when you leave the face of this earth. That day, it's like a roller coaster ride. You hand in your ticket, you get on the roller coaster, and you're gone. You got one chance at it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Here's the big one. The big argument that's always being used. They which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord, with the Lord. Caught up again. Caught up are words used by many when referring to the rapture. You see, the word caught up is not found in some of the old concordances you know first thessalonians 4 17 the word catch is listed under that scripture that word appears 13 times and is translated six different ways in scripture catch catch away catch cut pluck up take by force then the other 12 scriptures it has nothing to do with the physical removal of living people from the earth to heaven. It also talks there in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 4, about meeting in the air. And according to Strong's concordance, air in the Greek is A-E-R. It's used in the following scriptures. Acts 22, verse 23. And through dust into the air. 1 Corinthians 9.26, not as one who beateth the air. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 9, for ye shall speak in the air. Another Greek word, which is also translated air, is O-U-R-A-N-O-S, O-S. And you can find that usage Matthew 6, 26, 8, 20, 13, 32, Mark 4, 4. You're lucky I'm not reading all this stuff. Mark 4, 32, Luke 8, 5, 8, 5 9, 58, 13, 9, Acts 10, verse 12. 
Acts 11, 16. And each one of these scriptures that that is used refers to birds. The birds, the fowls of the air. This is the level we're talking about here, but somehow this has been taken and twisted to that we're going all the way up. It's talking about a different heaven, a different realm. It's talking about this realm. Basically what it's saying is grab a handful of dirt, throw it in the air, and that's about as far as you're going to go. Yeah, maybe we do levitate a little bit out of, out of excitement as the, the Messiah returns to the face of this earth so he can do what he's got to do while he's here. What, is he going to come here and rapture us away and then come back here and he's going to do all the things that are prophetic that he has to fulfill with no elect here, no people here? So he's got to come back twice? Well, that defeats another doctrine. John 17, 15. John 17, 50. I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong in the world just as I do not belong to the world. 17, 17 of John. Set them apart for holiness by means of the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. On their behalf, I am setting myself apart for holiness so that they too may be set apart for holiness by means of the truth. I pray not for these, but also for those who will trust in me because of their word. There are absolutely hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scriptures about the 10 lost tribes, how they're going to return, how God is going to forgive them of their sins and they're going to go back into the land of Israel, and that we are the prodigal son as Ephraim. And it talks about in the scripture how we will put our hand in the hand of Judah. We will put the stick, the two sticks together, and they will be one again. You have to eliminate and erase all of this stuff that's written in scripture prophetically written in scripture by tried and tested true prophets in order to even open up your mouth and say that Jesus Christ can come back at any minute. Well, he can, but he's not going to rapture everybody away like they're talking when they say that. Ezekiel 37, verse 19. Say to them, thus says the Lord God. Who? God speaking. Not your doctrine. Not what you think you believe. Thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. You see, but understand something. Satan came to the church and greatly deceived the people. But Satan can't deceive real prophets. Not when it comes to stuff like this. Because all you have to do is go through a quick checklist and it doesn't add up. You know, you look at somebody like Paul, the, the Apostle Paul. He was tricked for a few days and then he caught on. Yeah, you can get tricked, but eventually they all catch on. How many people, though, are going to sit there and they're going to see the title of what we're talking about and they're going to tune it out? When I sit up here and I tell them, you're going to go through it. I don't believe that. It's your doctrine. You're believing your doctrine, not the word of God. It's a spirit of religion and it's run rampant all the way through. And a spirit of religion is not a spirit of God. Christianity's being duped. Christian, Christians think that that's all there is. They think all they have to do is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And yes, you have to do that, but you're missing so much. But we've been led to slaughter. Led to slaughter by believing a lie and the lies that get preached. Things don't work the way that the church talks and the way that they, they teach. Because they've come up with their own doctrine, their own ways, 
and they've gotten absolutely away from the things of God. Wrong teaching, wrong believing is what it leads to. And God says, what my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge? Because they bought the lie generations ago through darkness about rapture, even about protection while you're on the face of this earth. Well, all I have to do is plead the blood of Jesus. Tear that one down too. Hosea 4, 6. I'll read it out of two versions. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shall be no priest to me. See, and thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Hosea is written to Ephraim. A lot of this stuff has to be fulfilled yet. And here we're talking about because you forgot the law, he's going to forget your kids. My people are destroyed for want of knowledge because you rejected knowledge. I will also reject you as Cohen for me because you forgot the Torah of God. I will also forget your children. Jump over to Daniel 7, verse 25. I think Hosea 4, 6 is pretty self-explanatory there. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall get, be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing time. What are we talking about here? Talking about people crying wolf. We're talking about crying rapture. We're talking about people saying, oh, the Mayan calendar has run out and we're going to be all, we're leaving the face of the earth because the Mayan calendar ran. When people prophesy in deceit and in deceitfulness, it is a curse. And we know there is so much of that going on. And when people open up their mouth and said, the word of God says this, and they're wrong about it, what are they doing? Misrepresenting God. What happens when you open up your mouth and you say, God said this, and he didn't say it? What are you doing? Misrepresenting God. There's curses that are tied to that. Not just for the person that does it, for the people that hear it. Well, I sat in my church and I heard that, but I didn't believe it, so it's not going to affect me. That's not what the scripture says. And it's talking about here in Daniel. He wears us out of the hope that we can understand. It adds confusion. All the stuff that is said and it doesn't come to pass. Darkness has infiltrated the church and darkness is wearing the people of the church out. They don't care anymore. They're numb to it all. They're out there saying, peace, 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 when there is no peace. Then they get into the run to and fro with every single wind of doctrine. He will go to any length to wear people out to the point in time where they just don't care. Then convinced a bunch of people at the same time that they can have protection just by pleading the blood of Jesus. That blood was shed to get you to heaven. Go back and listen to what we did last week on the bride of Messiah. And everything that was going on there, every drop was shed. For us as the bride, he had to pay the bride price. He had to die was the requirement from God. Nothing to do with your protection. But there are babes everywhere opening up their mouth thinking that they're all grown up. Matthew 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And yet we're deceived. Why? Because they think they're holier than thou. We're talking about the average Christian out here. Oh, it can't affect me. I'm a Christian. Yes, darkness can affect you. And yes, he's infiltrated. And he's infiltrated your belief system. There is not going to be a rapture. The mark is coming. And yet those who believe in the rapture will probably end up, and a good portion of them, will end up taking the mark, thinking that they should not be here. And Satan is sitting back going, thank you very much, church. You just handed them all over to me. This has been an ongoing fight for a long time between him and the Father. 
Well, what's it going to take? I know what it's going to take. It's going to take a plague for some people to start realizing. It's going to take a plague for the church to wake up and realize that the church isn't a safe haven. The Father, the Lord thy God, is your safe haven. But the church made it too easy. Peace, peace. Oh, just come sit here and you'll be all okay. Oh, we have this rapture. You won't have to go through that. You know what? Get your boxing gloves on and get your work boots on because we got a war to go through. But if he's wearing out this, the saints, what's he wearing out? Satan is dulling the swords of the spiritual warfare that people should be expecting to go into. He's already been taking out the enemy in preparation for the war. He started this back in what? Long time ago. False teaching, false believing dulls your sword, and that's all he wants to do. What do you think? He's going to just ignore the people of God? We are the ones that he is trying to go after. He's already got the rest of them. Church, you think you've gotten smarter than God. We were created by God, and you'll never figure him out. Never. Over and over and over, you hear garbage. Prophecies about the rapture, and then nothing happens. People have given their clothes away, and nothing happens. What we need to do is we need to understand what is right and what is wrong within Christianity. What about a Sunday Sabbath? Rapture theory. Communion. Basic rudiments of Christianity have all been twisted, trampled, misunderstood. God's got an order. God's got a way. The nice thing is, we can all come out of this stuff. We can ask for forgiveness, for believing in heresies, Gnostic ways, occult believings. I thought God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. We better figure out what he was talking about there. This is what he's talking about, because this has become a god, because you've allowed the occult, traditions, practices, magical things into your belief system. That's another God. And then they turn around and they preach it. Well, it's in the word of God. What is this? What are we talking about there? Breaking another commandment. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. It had nothing to do with swearing. It had everything to do with misrepresenting God. And here Satan has got them misrepresenting God, breaking the commandments of God so that he can accuse you to the Father. You better get it set straight. You better get it set straight, church, and teachers of the Word of God. Let's close in prayer. <laughs>